Well, it's good to be at the Anchor Baptist Church tonight. I didn't even know you folks existed. I didn't know where you were. But I know now, so I know how to get back here. And you got a sanctified sports complex. That's what you've got right here. And the greatest uh, exercise in all the world is exercising the godliness. That's what your pastor has in mind. I've just spent a few minutes with him, found out this place is 12 years old. And how many of you, I'd be interested to know, how many of you have been saved as a result of the Anchor Baptist Church in the last 12 years? Would you raise your hand? I've been saved. Good for you. God bless you. I'm glad for you. And I hope that you're reaching other people for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for the last three days since Friday night, I was over to the Harvest Baptist Church with Brother Getty. We had a good service. We had a, some very good services considering the preacher they had. We had some really good services. And uh, this morning, we had some people say, we had, a, we had a man named Charlie and his wife, Nikki, and they're from Nigeria. And they came, heard the gospel, got saved this morning. That's always exciting. Amen. And some other folks came, got saved. So I always get excited when people get saved. I'm an evangelist, and it's a little different than a pastor. They say we blow in, blow up, and blow out. <laughs> and so I'm here just long enough to blow one more time. And then your pastor's going to take me and get me a bite of salad, and I'm going to get on the all-night flight. I'm sorry my wife cannot be here. Her name is Regina. Now, the word Regina means queen, and I married her so I could be a king. Amen. <laughs> it's been working really good all these years. My wife and I have been married 80 years next Saturday. She's been married 40, and I've been married 40. So we've been married 80 years. And uh, we're going to go on a little second honeymoon and have a big time, and I'm going to turn the cell phone off and dare anybody to try to get in touch with me. And uh, so I'll get home tomorrow morning about 9.30. But I'm glad for the opportunity to be with you folks and uh, hope I can be some kind of a blessing. Turn in your Bible tonight, the book of Proverbs, the wisdom book, and go to chapter number 25 of the book of Proverbs. Pastor, thanks for letting me drop by and say hello. And uh, we pray God's richest blessings on this ministry. And we're glad that you're here. Appreciate those of you participating in the music. I can't play anything. I can't play the radio without getting static. And so I'm always glad for people that have musical ability. My wife comes from a singing family. All three of my kids sing. And they said, Dad, you just preach. You just preach. And so I'll, I'll just preach. Would you stand? We'll read one verse of Scripture together. Proverbs chapter 25 and verse 28. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. Let's all read that verse together. Here we go. He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls. We'll bring you a little message tonight entitled, A Little Thing That Makes a Big Difference. Thank you. You can be seated. Heavenly Father, thank you for the book. It will not change, but it can change us. Now speak to our hearts tonight. And help us to understand what the writer meant, how to apply it to our lives, and live it out in the coming week. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. How many of you have a hobby or a pastime? Could I see your hands? One of my hobbies, believe it or not, is reading logos and slogans. I'm an evangelist, and so I see a lot of bumper stickers, a lot of billboards. My wife and I were in a crusade some years back, and we were flying back on an airplane, and she was reading one of those exciting, illustrious airline magazines. And she said, honey, look at this. There's, there's a plaques, and they got different logos on them. You might like some of these. One of them said, attitude is contagious. Another one said, attitude is everything. The one I like said, a little thing that makes a big difference, dash, attitude. I said, that is a great title for a message. Now, I, I teach homiletics, and you're never supposed to get a title before the text. You always get a text, then a title. But, Pastor, I said, that's such a good title. There's got to be a text somewhere for that <laughs> in the Bible. Well, one of the first things I did is I Googled the word attitude to find out what the world had to say. I found out USA Today did a study on 3,000 employers and asked this question, what's the number one thing you look for when looking to hire? And it was not academics. It was attitude. Harvard University said 85% for the reason of succeeding at any area of life is attitude. In the Fortune 500 companies, the guys who make a lot of money, they ask, why are you successful? 94% said attitude. 
Nissan is the car with attitude. There's a lot of books out, Attitude 101. And I said, man, the world has a lot to say about attitude. I said, well, I'm leaving the world and I'm going to go study the word. And so I looked up the word attitude and guess what? The word attitude is never used in the English Stand, English Standard Version. Forgive that Freudian slip. <laughs> is never used in your English Bible. You say, how are you going to preach on something that's not there? Well, the word is not there, but the synonym is, it's the word spirit. Everybody say the word together. Ready? Spirit. spirit. Say it again. Spirit. It means disposition of the mind or attitude. It's used many times in the word of God. Numbers 5.14 talks of the spirit of jealousy. Numbers 14, 24, but my servant Caleb, for he had another spirit with him and hath followed me fully. Mm -hmm. Psalm 77, 3 says, when I complained, my spirit was overwhelmed. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the spirit of a man is the candle of the Lord searching the innermost part of the belly. My favorite is Daniel 6 and 3. Daniel's over 85 years of age. And the Bible says this Daniel was preferred above the presence and princes because an excellent spirit was in him. Attitude is prominent in the Bible. You know, when you die, you will not be primarily remembered for your attire or accomplishments. Number one thing people are going to remember you for is your attitude. I'll get on United Airlines tonight. And believe it or not, in the cockpit, they have an attitude indicator. Now, the first time I heard that, I said, no, it's an altitude indicator. But it's not. It's an attitude indicator. I was riding on a flight the other day next to a Delta pilot. And I said, let's talk shop. I said, I'm a witness to you, but I, I want to talk about flying. I said, is it true that you all have an attitude indicator? He said, yeah, are you a pilot? I said, no, I'm a preacher, but I collect illustrations. I said, is it, I said, is it true that the attitude indicator tells the position of the plane relationship that arises? He said, you're on. I said, if, it, if you're going up, they call it nose up. If you're going down, call it nose down. He said, man, you got it. You know, your attitude does determine your altitude, and it will 24-7. Yes, now, here in the text, the Bible says, He that hath no rule or control over his own spirit and, and attitudes, like a city broken down without walls. Let me give you some simple truths tonight. Number one, your attitude is your choice. I want to say it again. Your attitude is your choice. Everybody say it with me. Your attitude is your choice. I'll start it. You finish it. Your attitude is your choice. Help me again now. Your attitude is your choice. Hold that thought because I'll be back. It is not a chance. It's a choice. Winston Churchill said people, or excuse me, Abraham Lincoln said people are about as happy as they choose to be. If you're miserable tonight, it's your fault because you're in charge of your attitude. Winston Churchill said responsibility is the price of greatness. God, through his writer in the Psalms, said in Psalm 9, verse 2, I will be glad and rejoice in thee. Psalm 9 and verse 14, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Psalm 40 and verse 8, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Part of the will of God is rejoicing. Philippians 4, 4 commands us rejoice in the Lord. Next word. And again, I say rejoice. Make the choice to rejoice. It is your choice every single day. I'll start it, you finish it. Your attitude is your choice. It is actually a result of your focus. I tell people your focus will determine your future. So here's my focus on God. I believe that God is good all the time. Amen. Now that's settled with me. And I, I, I have believed this for years. No matter what I see, it's what God says that makes a difference. The Bible says... In Psalm 119, 60, uh, Psalm 119, 163, Thou art good and doest good. Psalm 107, verses 8, 15, 21, and 31, four times, all oh, the men would praise the Lord for His goodness to the children of men. Now, if you believe that, when you get out of bed in the morning, you can say Psalm 118, 24, This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. When you sit down at breakfast, you can say Psalm 68, 19, Blessed be God that daily loads us with benefits. Well, my wife made oatmeal. I don't like oatmeal. Put raisins in it and rejoice in the Lord. There's always something good you can praise God for. But it's also reflected in your face. Somebody said, Preacher, why don't you look at your notes? Well, I memorize most of what I do because I'd rather look at you. 
I never have seen notes get saved or get under conviction, so I'd rather talk to you. <clears throat> My wife likes to shop. I like to watch people. I don't know why anybody goes to the zoo, go to the mall. <laughs> because your face tells me a lot about you. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 5, Cain was wroth and his countenance fell. There's times that you be with somebody and you see them coming and you go, it's not going to be a good day. I can just see, but see it by his face. The Bible tells us in Proverbs uh, chapter 21 and verse 29, a wicked man hardens his face. At my age, I'm still preaching in camps all over the world, and I preach to thousands of teenagers this summer, and I can sit on the platform and tell you what the problem is in the first three minutes. You can look around in the song service and you can tell, can't you, preacher? It doesn't take long. Because your face tells you. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 13, that the merry heart makes a cheerful countenance or a cheerful face. You say, well, I am happy. Tell your face. It hadn't heard yet. Right. You see, if you're happy here, let it explode here. You say, preacher, you don't know my problem. Well, by the way, somebody have a bottle of water? Oh, there is. Oh, God bless you. This is one windmill that's run by water. That's great. Amen. Canadian water. All right. Bottled and shipped in from the United States. Came out of a garden hose, folks. Just enjoy it. But uh, <coughs> interestingly enough, I know a fellow. In fact, he's a preacher. And he was in 20 foster homes by the time he was 16. I wonder if anybody can match that. Now, he ought to be dysfunctional, disoriented, and everything else is negative. But he's one of the most exciting guys you ever met in your life. When he was two years old, his dad was arrested, put in state pen. He doesn't know if he's still in state pen or dead because he can't identify him. His mother didn't want him. She gave him to Grandma. Grandma didn't want him, so she gave him to one foster parent. And by the time he's 16, 20 foster homes. But he didn't walk around and complain. If he walked through this door, you would go, What's he up to? Because he's always smiling. He walks with a spring in his step, song in his heart. Because your attitude is your? Oh, my soul, people, you're slow. I'm going to take a drink of water and try that again. <laughs> I said your attitude is your? Choice. All right, number one, your attitude's your choice. Number two, your attitude brings consequences. If I look down at the text, he that hath no ruler of his own spirit is like. A city broken down and without walls. Now, what in the world does that mean? We've got to turn time back and understand what walls were for. Number one, they were for defense. A city with no walls was wide open to plunder. Number two, they were for dignity. Did you know that Jericho had double thick walls? I'm not sure if you've studied about Babylon, but the walls of Babylon were 350 uh, yards high. Or three and excuse yeah three hundred fifty yards high, a, a lot larger, taller, literally than a football field. They were so wide you could ride eight chariots side by side on those walls, and people took pride in those walls. So here's the deal: if you don't have a good attitude, you're like a city that's wide open and vulnerable, and you're gonna get yourself in trouble. Hmm. Now, when a city had broken walls or no walls, the first response was ridicule. In Nehemiah chapter 1 and verse 3, Hananiah comes and Nehemiah asks him concerning Jerusalem. He said, the remnant that are left in the captivity are in great affliction, and the walls are broken down, and there is reproach. The word reproach means to hiss. You realize historically that when people walked by walls that were down in a city, they called it no city at all, and, and many times they would for they'd say that city doesn't even deserve to be called a city. Now you know why Nehemiah began to weep because the city of peace, Jerusalem, was a city in pieces. Do you realize that if you have a bad attitude, you're going to be ridiculed? I'm not sure if some people realize this, but some of you may be the talk of the office, but not the kind of talk you want. You may be the talk of the church, but not the kind of talk you want. You may be the talk of the school, but not the kind of talk you want. Let me illustrate. How many of you have ever been to a restaurant and got a bad waiter or a bad waitress? Would you raise your hand? There's nothing like paying to be abused, is there? Years ago, I had a team, and there were seven of us. I was married. My song leader was married. And we had three single guys. I was in my 20s. 
And uh, we stopped to eat a lot. You take guys in their 20s, we were always hungry. We stopped to eat in a certain city I will not name, and we couldn't even get anybody to seat us. And finally, we just kind of had to seat ourselves, and then I saw this lady coming. We were in kind of a round table, and I saw her before the rest of the guys did, and her face said, I don't like you, and you're in trouble. And I'm thinking, wow, this lady was big, kind of like a brontosaurus, <laughs> <clears throat> and she had a bad attitude, and she's coming, and I'm thinking, we are in big trouble. And she did not say, hi, my name is, can I take an order? She threw the menus out. They slid off the table, and I caught mine. I didn't even get it open. She said, what do y'all want? We just ordered. We wanted to live. So we just, whatever you got will be fine. She turned around and went back. And one of the guys said, what's her problem? I said, I don't know, but don't mess with her. So I see her coming a second time. I said, boys, she's got water and silverware. Now, you know what she did with the menus? We were preparing to get baptized and stabbed. Hang on. Well, every time was worse. Finally, we got our meal. The meal was cold and she was hot, but we ate it anyway. And then she came to the end of the meal. And this one, this one I'll never forget. If I lose my mind, I'll remember this. She walked up and had a pad in her hand. Never brought us a menu. And she said, y'all want dessert? We got pie, apple pie, pecan pie, pumpkin pie. What kind of pie you want? So we ordered pie. <laughs> no sooner did she turn around and get out of ear's distance and the guy sitting next to me said, you want pie? We got pie. Apple pie, pecan pie, pumpkin pie. We got out in the van. One of the guys said, you want pie? We got pie. Apple pie, pecan pie, pumpkin pie. We had a 15-year reunion. One of the guys looked up at me and said, you remember that, big la that lady that came to serve us? You want pie? We got pie. Apple. That's an amazing thing. And she brought that on herself because she had a bad attitude. You'll be ridiculed. Second, you'll be robbed. When a, when a city had no walls or broken walls, they were open to plunder. Isaiah 42, 22, this people's robbed and spoiled. Isn't that interesting? My father was a lay preacher, and he worked on a secular job, and he tried to help a man who didn't really want help. I don't know about you, but when I was a kid, there were certain people I didn't want to be around. I was afraid of this guy. When I became a teenager, I wasn't afraid of him. I still didn't want to be around him. He had what we call from my neck of the woods a tood, and I mean a bad tood. Now, he would had polio when he was a boy, and they hiked up his shoe just a little bit. That wasn't the thing that scared me. I never saw him smile. Everything was negative. When he died, my dad and mom went to the funeral with about four other people. Because he had driven everybody away from him. The only reason his wife stayed with him is because she'd signed the marriage uh, thing and agreed to be stay married to him. They had a miserable marriage. He had a miserable life. And he drove everybody away. His name was Bill. When I was off in Bible college, I met another guy. He didn't have a little handicap. He had a big one. If he were to walk through this door tonight or back through here, his arms are twisted out like this with metal crutches. His legs are like this. And they have braces down them. And when he walked, Across the campus, he walked like still see him. He sweated in the dead of winter, but he was one of the neatest guys you ever met. If you said, hey, Bill, how you doing? Everybody on campus knew him. Hey, Bill, how you doing? He'd raise his crutch and say, praising the Lord, how about you? And it was the real deal. He wasn't phony. He was the real deal. Well, he, I had 75 guys on my hall. He lived catty-cornered. Everybody liked him. Everybody wanted to do something for him. At night, if they were going to snack shop, they'd come by and say, hey, Bill, Going to get something to eat. You want something? You want a candy bar? You want a Coke? You want a Cadillac? What do you want, man? We'll get anything you want. Everybody loved Bill. I went around to some guys and I said, you know, he has a terrible time getting across campus. I said, let's take up a collection and buy him a golf cart. They said, that's a great idea. So we took up enough money to get him a used golf cart and we put a ribbon on the front of it and put it right out in front of his dorm. And I said, somebody go in and get him. We had hundreds of us out there. Somebody go in there and get him. And he came out walking, and we started applauding. Man, he lit up like two Christmas trees. Now, Bill was smart. He did not drive. No, 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 no. He got in the front seat and rode shotgun and let a friend of mine drive. And they started making laps around the campus, and he had his crutch up, waving at everybody. Looked like he was running for office, man. I'm telling you, he was a great guy. I told that story at Ambassador Baptist College, and a guy blurted out while I was preaching, 
He said, I remember him. I said, yeah, you gave money. God bless you. And so when the thing was over, he walked up. He said, have you seen Bill recently? I said, I haven't seen him in 30 years. He said, man, he is doing great. He said, I saw him down in the state of Florida. He walks as best he can, smiles, leads people to Jesus. You know what the difference in those two bills were? Attitude. Attitude. One guy had a little handicap and a stinking attitude and no friends. The other guy had what we call a major handicap and a great attitude and lots of friends. Did you ever stop to think that really the only handicap you have is your attitude? Number three, you'll not only be ridiculed and robbed, but you'll be ruined. If you'll study, you'll find in 605 B.C. the Babylonians marched into Jerusalem. They occupied the city, but in 589, they destroyed it. Marriages are destroyed by attitudes. Churches are destroyed by attitudes. Friendships are destroyed by attitudes. And your health is destroyed by attitudes. Say, so preacher, what do you mean? They're doing studies now in medicine. I read a lot. I'll read all the way home. I don't sleep a lot. I just read a lot, and I... And they're doing studies now in medicine, and they found this. If you're diagnosed with either a bad disease or a terminal disease, your attitude makes a difference in whether you heal or don't. And this is documented. Your body, when you have a good attitude, will secrete hormones that help you heal. But if you have a bad attitude, poisons flood your system, and you'll check out prematurely. And that's documented. Somebody said, aren't scientists brilliant? Scientists have always been behind God. Mm -hmm. Proverbs 17, 22, let's see if you know this verse. A merry heart doeth good like a... Medicine. You see, you have a choice every day. Some of you could heal your marriage if you'll change your attitude. Some of you could heal your heart if you'll change your attitude. Some of you could heal a relationship if you'll have a good attitude. Your attitude is your, help me folks. Thank you. And finally, your attitude can be conquered. Notice it says, he that hath no rule. That means if you don't control your attitude, it's your fault. But you can, by the grace of God and the power of God, control your attitude. How do you do that? Take your Bible, go to Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. The Bible says in verse 32, he that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he that ruleth, there's our word again, his spirit, or he who controls his attitude than he that takes a city. God said, I'll tell you something. Your attitude is not only your choice, and it's not only brings consequences, but it can be conquered if you choose to. You say, preacher, how can I do that? Well, number one, confess your fault. Confess your sin and tell God where you're wrong. Do you realize a conky attitude is sin? You ever been around somebody that always feels like they're better than somebody else? Proverbs 6, 16 says, These six things the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination. First one he mentions is a proud look. If you look down on somebody else, you've got a stinking attitude, and it needs to be confessed. Do you have a carnal attitude? In other words, all you're thinking about is material possessions and things of this life, and you don't meditate. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded or carnally spirited is death. You need to confess that is sin. You have a complaining attitude? There's some people that are grumps. That's all they do, complain, complain. Numbers 11, 1 said, when the people complain to displease the Lord. Do you have a critical attitude? Nobody can do it right but you. Everybody always does it wrong. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good for the use of edifying. Proverbs 28.13 says, He that covereth his sin. You better get this. Not his oops, but his sin shall not prosper. Now, <clears throat> you can say tonight, Preacher, you don't understand my family. You don't understand how I was preached, uh, treated. You don't understand my neighborhood. Nobody understands the Bible. And the Bible says if you don't control your spirit, you are ruining your life. Now, psychiatrists won't tell you this, and psychologists won't tell you that. They will say you're dysfunctional, you have a syndrome, and you can't help it. 
God said, you don't have a syndrome, you have a sin. Stop saying you're dysfunctional and admit you're disobedient. And obey the Bible and God will change your life. Amen. Say, I don't like that. Neither does the devil. But you need to learn that if God's going to do anything for your life. Go ahead and make your excuses. Let me ask you a question. How good have you been doing? Have your excuses made you healthier, happier, and holier? And the answer is absolutely not. Stop making excuses. The word confess means agree with God. God, I agree with you. I got a bad attitude. God said, great. I'm faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you. So that's step one. You say, I'm not going to do that. Well, you can take a nap for the rest of it. I'm almost done. But if you won't confess your sin, you are not going to get well. Number two, not only confess your failure, but number two, change your focus. Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The old boys where I used to grow up said, you ain't what you think you are, but you are what you think. I go around the country, I tell people, when it comes to your attitude, pull weeds and plant seeds. Would you say that with me? Pull weeds and plant seeds. Why don't you jerk up complaining and start praising? What will I praise God for? Well, if you're saved, you're not going to hell. That's a good place to start. You're regenerated, redeemed, reconciled, presently seated with God in heavenly places, and you're going to live with Him forever. Somebody ought to smile tonight and say amen. Amen. So start by pulling the weed of complaining and put in the seed of joy. Stop criticizing your wife. You really think she loves you because you put her down? Man, where in the world did you come from? If you started praising her, it might get a little sweeter at the house. Amen. Pull weeds and plant seeds. Does anybody in this room like football? Could I see your hands? I got some fans out there. Foot, I think football's the reason God made TV. I like to watch football. For many years, my wife and I lived in Kansas City, Missouri, and we were Chiefs fans. If you lived in Kansas City, I'll confess my sin on my own, thank you. <clears throat> if you were in Kansas City, you were a Chiefs fan. I was never home. If, if my pastor saw me two Sundays a year, that was something because I was constantly preaching. But I was home from time to time, and my neighbor sold Logo 7 Chiefs jerseys and paraphernalia. He'd get on the phone, he'd say, hey, would you and your son, my son's 33, he's a preacher, say, would you and your son like to go see a Chiefs game? I said, let me pray. Amen. See out the car. And so we go. (laughs) Now, we had a quarterback for a few years traded us from the San Francisco 49ers named Joe Montana. Has anybody ever heard of Joe Montana? We got some football fans out there. I'm not using Joe as a spiritual great Giant. He was anything but that, but he was a good ball player. Sports Illustrated said he was probably the best quarterback in the 20th century. I watched him play. He dropped back in the pocket, and he'd fling that thing. Man, I'm telling you what, it was went like a bullet. If his pass receiver dropped it, you'd see Joe do this every time. Go back to the huddle. Go back to the huddle. So a sportscaster asked him one day, Joe, what are you doing? And he said, every play is a new play. You know what he was doing? He was shaking it off. How many of you play sports? Anybody play sports? You take a shot, you hit the rim and it falls out, you concentrate on that shot, you're going to miss the next one. Huh? Am I right? You got to shake it off. I went home and wrote down in my Bible, instead of every play is a new play, I wrote down every day is a new day. I heard about a guy that was on an elevator, and he was having a great day and singing and having the time of his life, and he got on the first floor, and another fellow got on the fourth floor, and he was having a blue Monday. And this guy that got on the first floor was just singing, 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 and irritated this guy over here. Finally, he turned around and said, what are you so happy about? And the guy that was singing paused long enough to look and smile and say, I've never lived this day before, and kept right on singing. Amen. Amen. You do not have to be miserable. You do not, as a Baptist, have looked like an advertisement for a gallbladder attack. You can have the joy of the Lord as your spring. So number one, confess your failure. Number two, change your focus. Number three, communicate your faith. Now I've done a whole lot of study about the shrinks. Most shrinks need a shrink. 
And uh, <clears throat> it, you don't realize I'm giving you counsel tonight and we cost you $75 for a half hour while you were comfortable on the couch. Yeah. Now, what they would tell you is this. They would say, you need to have self-talk. Self-talk. What that means is you can get you a stack of cards and they will tell you what to say as if you're dummy. And, and, and you can shave, and while you're shaving, you can say, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful, I'm wonderful. All the time you're going, I ain't that good, I know that. But you can say it if you want to. Let me give you a word for that, it's called stupid, okay? God never teaches self-talk, God teaches scripture talk. Amen. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the written therein it. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. One verse in the Bible uses the word success, and is connected to the Scripture. Yes, sir. Little Scripture, little success. No Scripture, no success. Much Scripture, much success. You're not a success because you're money, sir. Your money won't do you one hill of beans at the judgment seat of Christ. But your attitude will come across and be judged, so you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. Now, how do you communicate Scripture? Well... You say, preacher, tomorrow morning i got to get up and get out in all this traffic. Well, you have a bad attitude about traffic. I've got a question. Have you ever moved traffic faster hollering at everybody? Get off the road! Where's your answer license? You ever notice traffic doesn't move any faster? Here's my favorite. A guy has a flat tire, and he gets out, kicks it, and cusses. That's brilliant, isn't it? I've never seen a tire reinflate while he's cussing. So now he's not only got a flat tire, he's got a busted foot and a headache all at the same time. I mean, there's some things that are just downright dumb. I heard about a young, a little boy who always rode with his daddy to school. His daddy always hollered at everybody. Well, his mother took him one day, and when he got to school and got out, he looked back at his mother and said, Mama, where are all those idiots daddy sees on the road every day? <laughs> Better help me tonight. Your attitude is your choice. You're a little slow, but you're getting there. John 16, 33, in the world you shall have tribulation or traffic or your boss. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Amen. That's what it says. Good. Romans 8, 37, nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. I'll tell you what. I've never heard so much stupid stuff. Ph.D. pastor in some circles must stand for post hole dicker. That's the only thing I've figured. I've never met so many people go to school so long and come out so dumb in my life. You got to cope, man. You got to learn to cope. Where are you going? I'm going to a cope group. What y'all going to do? We're going to cope. That sounds like a wonderful thing to do. What'd you do for two hours? We cope. Bible never talks about coping anywhere. It says we're more than conquerors. Amen. Why would you cope when you can conquer? Good. Why would you exist when you can excel? Amen. The Bible says in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Amen. Start talking scripture. Good. Start Good. communicating the word of God. Start singing the word of God. Say, I don't feel like singing. Who asked you what you felt like? Do what's right because it's right. Amen. Amen. You go in and you, your son's in sound asleep, 17 years old in bed. Time to get up. Got to go to school. I don't feel like it. Do you go back and say to your husband, he doesn't feel like it, I guess we'll let him sleep? Hello. That sure didn't fly at my house. My dad would say, I don't care what you feel like, get your lazy carcass out of bed. Yes, sir. And I was gone. And by the way, I bless his memory. He's been in heaven since 1997. I learned some discipline from him, and I'm glad for that. You've got, you got to get over yourself. You've got to quit living for yourself. You've got to quit pampering yourself. You've got to quit licking all your wounds, and you got to do what's right because it's right. Learn how to sing. Learn how to praise God. Learn how to quote Scripture. Amen. Confess your faults. Change your focus. Communicate your faith. And finally, celebrate your future. Amen. Did you know you don't have to be tomorrow what you are today? Good. You say, really? Absolutely. Philippians 1, 6 says, Being caught for this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Jesus Christ. They preach, I've never met you before, but I don't like you. You will if you go to heaven. Right. And by the way, you'll like you better in heaven because we're all in process of being changed. Could I get an amen? amen. Right. We haven't arrived yet. Right. Ephesians 2.10 says we are his workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus and two good works, which he had before ordained that we might walk in them. Do you realize, sir, that if you'd allow God to change your attitude, you might in a week have to reintroduce yourself to your wife because she won't even know who you are. Hi, I'm your husband. Yeah, but you never acted like this before. I like this. <laughs> and it might get sweet at home. Your kids just might have a different dad and mom if you change your attitude. Some of you look at me like, I'm watching you. If you smile, it will not break your face. It really won't. And it takes less muscles to smile than it does to frown. Right. Preacher, am I okay to have, I've been preaching the word of God tonight. Okay, good. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. So you celebrate your future. God wants to change you. The question is, do you want to be changed? Right, right. I've always been like this. Well, enjoy your misery. Yeah, that's it. That's foolish. Well, I was born like this. Well, get over it. You don't have to be what you are. God can change you. Good. Good. You don't have to have a bad attitude. Right. You can have a good attitude. You don't have to be a complainer. You can be a communicator of truth. Good. You don't have to be a coward. You can be a conqueror. You don't have to be what you are unless you want to stay that way. Well, you don't understand. I got this thing and I can't get over it. No, you were taught that by people who didn't read this. Good yes. See, this book is the only book that can change your life permanently. Amen. And Amen. make you like Jesus Christ. Right. Well, I've enjoyed being here tonight. Preach, I'm going to tell you a couple of stories and you can come and close and we'll, we'll, we'll go whatever we're going to do. We're going to go out to eat. You're going to pay. Hey, Amen. i got a good attitude. <laughs> and uh, I'm enjoying this. <clears throat> I, I was reading about birds that go across the desert. One is a vulture and the other is a hummingbird. Now, they go across the same desert but they look for something different. Vultures look for whatever is dead and rotting. Hummingbirds birds look for whatever is alive and blossoming. Vultures live off the past. Hummingbirds live in the present. Both birds find what they're looking for. You're going to find tonight what you're looking for. You're going to find in your family what you're looking for. If you're looking to pick your family apart, you'll find it. Yes. If you're looking to be negative about something, you'll find it. Two men looked through prison bars. One saw mud, the other saw stars. All depends on where you focus. How many of you know the name Thomas Edison? Would you raise your hand? Thomas Edison, at 90 years of age, was still inventing. You talk about a guy with a great attitude. Thomas Edison's place caught on fire. His factory caught on fire. And they got him out of bed and he went out and he was watching it burn. And while it was burning, he said to one of his sons, go get your mother. She's never seen a fire like this before. <laughs> they said, what are you going to do? He said, rebuild. Yeah. And he did. Yeah. You've heard of Thomas Edison. He was working on the incandescent light bulb and it took time and time and time again if you read history, you'll find it was a smart aleck newspaper writer that came to see him one day and said, Mr. Edison, I understand you've experimented with this 10,000 times. He said, that's right. He said, how does it feel to have failed 10,000 times? Edison said, have a seat, son, and we'll change your life. He said, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I now know 10,000 things that don't work. <laughs> and he said, when I figure out what does work, we'll have the incandescent light bulb. 4,000 experiments later, voila, we sit in light. Now, everybody in the room's heard of Thomas Edison. Does anybody like to stand tonight and tell me the smart aleck newspaper writer's name? You don't know and you don't care, and the difference is attitude. Because your attitude is your choice. Let's stand. We'll have prayer together. Dear Lord, it's been good to be at the Anchor Baptist Church. Thank you for calling this fine pastor here. Thank you for the folks that have joined us tonight. We can't argue with the Bible. At least we can't win arguing. We can't change the book, but the book can change us. And so would you help us tonight to be honest about where we stand before you? We're bowed before the Lord. I wonder how many of you would have to say tonight, you know what, preacher? God spoke to me about an attitude or an attitude's
or attitudes that are not right in my life. I'm not going to argue about it. I'm not going to get mad about it. I'm not going to blame somebody about it. I realize tonight my attitude's my choice. And I need to confess that and let God cleanse me. Now, if you're a real honest person, and God spoke to you tonight about an attitude or attitudes in your life that you are not, know are not right, and you want to get right, and you want God to change your attitude, and you'd say, Preacher, before you go to the airport, pray for me. Raise your hand real high. Just hold it up real high. Many of you, good night. 85% of you, great. Dear Heavenly Father, it's been my privilege just to stop by and say hello to these good folk. We all wrestle with our attitudes. Uh, I, I, I took a plane here and got a middle seat. That's not my favorite place. But I thank you that you gave me a seat to get here. And help me, Lord, to take my own medicine and understand what the Bible teaches concerning our attitude. Help these folks tonight. Some of them may need to go see a husband, wife, child, mother, father, friend, loved one, pastor, and say, forgive me for a bad attitude. Some of us just need to simply say, this is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice. Blessed be the God that daily loads us with benefits. And we need to stop talking trash and start talking truth. And I pray tonight we'll learn that and you'll use this for your honor, for your glory in Jesus' name. Would you look this way? How many of you know the song, uh, God is so good? Does anybody know that song here? Y'all know the song? Let's sing it together. God is so good. You believe that? God is so good. God is so good. He's so good to me. One more time. Your attitude is your choice. Pastor, you come close, would you?